Yeah, you got all the books. Yeah. yeah Welcome back to, to Inside Personal Growth. This is Greg Voison, the host of Inside Personal Growth. And today from Albuquerque, New Mexico, joining us is Glenn Aparicio Perry. And he has a new book out called Original Politics, uh, Making America Sacred Again. Good day to you, Glenn. How you doing? I'm doing very well. And how are you, Greg? I'm doing good here. And I know that you and I are going to talk about a lot of things today that are really, really important to this country and to the world. And I want to let the people know a little bit about you. Uh, Glenn is an author of a Nautilus award-winning book called Original Thinking, A Radical Revisioning of Time, Humanity, and Nature. And for those of you interested, we're going to put a link on the blog to podcast 530 on Inside Personal Growth, because that was actually done in July of 2015. So that was 300 podcasts ago. Um, he's an educator, an eco-psychologist, and a political philosopher. The founder and past president of Seed Institute. Uh, Glenn is currently the director of Grassroots Think Tank, the Circle for Original Thinking. Uh, Glenn organized and participated in groundbreaking language of spirit conferences from 1999 to 2011, and my relationship with him goes all the way back there. He moderated for Leroy Little Bear that brought together Native American and Western scientists to engage in dialogue. And for all of my listeners, we will have a link, but it's really easy to get to it. Go to originalthinking.us is where you can actually uh, reach Glenn. And there you're gonna find where you can see his books, events, media. And we're also gonna put a link to the book trailer that he just sent to me the other day. So you're gonna wanna get this book because um, it's a fascinating weaving of history um, where original politics kind of emanated from the Native Americans' involvement in that, and he brings out a lot of important points. And Glenn, you start off the introduction of the book by saying that original politics emerged because you realized that some original thinking about American politics was necessary at this time. Um, I think it's a great way for you to start with our listeners. Tell the listeners about the origin of the word original um, and why you wrote the book now. Why is this so important now? Well, that's very interesting. The way you phrased the question already answered it, actually. So mm -hmm. you said, what is the origin of original? Well, the, mm -hmm. the origin of original is the origin. <laughs> <laughs> it's place. It's place. So original is one of the weirdest words in the English language and it's it, it was the basis for my first book original thinking because Leroy Little Bear who was the moderator of the of the seed dialogues asked that question you know is it possible to have an original thought and when he asked that question all the western people in the room with the exception of one I think uh, Lee Nickel who was the editor for David Bohm but uh, all the Western people in the room were trying to struggle to think of something brand new that had never been said before or done before. Mm. Where the indigenous people took the question completely differently as an invitation to connect to origin as a place. So what is original for indigenous people is something that emerges from place. And really that's the difference between a Western cosmology and an indigenous cosmology. If you ask a Hopi elder, uh, you know, where did you come from? They take you to the confluence of the, the, uh, uh, the little Colorado and the big Colorado river and to a Sipapu, the emergence point where they came from the lower world up until this world. But if you ask a Western cosmologist, you know, how did the universe, uh, what's the origin of the universe? they go to the beginning of time. They, they like to say that, you know, the, the universe is such and such billion years old. You know, I always wonder then what was it before? You know, I mean, it's just, <laughs> right. for indigenous people, the universe has always been here. 
which actually is a very appealing concept to me. It makes more sense to me than the start of a universe. But, but it's built in to our language and our worldview to everything has to have a beginning, middle, and end. Mm -hmm. So that's the, the Western worldview has a lot. That's how linear time emerged. And maybe it's only after linear time emerged that we went back and looked and revise the way we thought of the origin of the cosmos. So the book Original Politics, when I use that word, and it's the second part of a three-part series, original thinking being the first, original politics now, original love is gonna be the third. Um, so original politics emerged, yes, I did want a, some original thinking, but you know, not in the sense of new, um, in the sense of returning to place, in the sense of understanding that, that uh, just as William Faulkner said, you know, the past is not dead. In fact, it isn't even past. So all the memories, all the beautiful sacred ceremonies that have been done on this land, formerly called Turtle Island, now called America, uh, all the ceremonies that have been done are here, all that beautiful energy, and also all the atrocities, the massacres, the, the violence that has been committed on the land, that's also held in the memories of the land. Um, so really, you know, that's the origin point of original politics. And then also I, I define original politics as really politics that includes the natural world. Mm -hmm. And that's distinguished from a Western politics since Socrates, where, the, where, where they were looking for the greater good is only the greater good of humans. Well, I think in the book, when you tell the history about the Native Americans' actual participation in the Declaration of Independence and the, the documents that came from this country, I think many people forget that, right? They... they um, I'm not saying that Native Americans are forgotten, but as you know, they weren't treated real well, and obviously there's been an issue there. But you have a connection to Native Americans, and you dedicated this book to the ancestors of the land as well as the next generation. That was one of the points of the book. Uh, how do you envision leaving a sacred America to the next generation? Because I have grandkids, I don't know about you, but I keep looking at what's going on right now. And I would say, um, this is a tough time for people. I mean, it's a tough time to envision what might be into the future, but we can change that by changing our mindset. Um, and that's what's got it. We can change our consciousness. We can change our ability to think about things in a new you're saying not new, but let's say uh, or origin, original uh, thinking. So yeah. explain if you would. You sound like Ricky Ricardo for a moment. <laughs> I don't want to do any mansplaining, you know, so I don't want to offend the women here. No, no. Uh, no. Uh, Jeez, you're making me laugh. You're, me you're laugh. the one that made yeah. me laugh. But the Ricky first thing, the, fir the first thing, <laughs> The first thing about uh, that is, it's not the next generation, it's the next seven generations. So I dedicate the, this book to the ancestors and to the next seven generations. So it, it's, it's the, the, the Haudenosaunee um, uh, or Iroquois always would say that in their prayers and lots of Native Americans plan very far ahead for multiple generations. And they also think back to, you know, they. They do think of the ancestors. The ancestors are never gone. They're kind of still here. Their energy is still here. And they're, um, in some ways, it really means to, when you think of seven generations, it's seven generations backward and seven generations forward. Um, so it's our responsibility to leave a sacred America for future generations. Um, and uh, that's super important. And the... And, and the reason why I titled the book, you know, Making America Sacred Again, 
obviously I'm partly playing off Donald Trump's Make America Great Again, but there's a, right. there's a big difference between... Um, great and sacred. Yeah, there's a big difference between great and sacred. Well, I yeah. well, I tend to think of great like the 1927 Yankees or something. Babe Ruth hitting 60 home runs and, you know, Lou Gehrig and, and having that kind of a powerful, dominant team. And I think that is the way Donald Trump intends it, actually. Um, and the where sacred, sacred also has power, but the power comes from the land. The power comes from... Uh, nature. It's not the power of the human ego. Um, so when things are sacred, they invoke the whole. I mean, it comes with the Latin saccare, meaning, you know, you know to, to devote or dedicate. So you devote or dedicate yourself to the whole tribe, the whole community, the whole natural world. Those things are sacred enterprise. And mm -hmm. that's the, the basis of what I'm talking about for a sacred or original politics. Well, it certainly, it, it, it was a book that intrigued me and woke me up to many things that um, I maybe was slightly aware of, but not to the degree that you explained them in the book. And um, original politics unfolds in four interrelated parts. Um, mirroring how nature unfolds in iterative cycles, right? I know when I've gone up to the Orcas Islands to do meditation retreats, we bow to the north, to the west, to the east, to the south, what the Native American Indians would do as well. Um, and that's a cycle because, the, the, as you know, uh, they, they knew, we know as well, that the cold comes from the north and we have you know, winter and summer and spring and fall and all the parts of nature. Can you explain to the listeners these four interrelated parts of the book? Certainly. Um, I, since we're listening, but with, it, with is a there video on this podcast? Yeah, this is a video podcast. It's a video podcast. <laughs> so I'm also going to use video <laughs> visualization. So, so there's actually a circle. Um, and in the in the book, I describe four interrelated circles. Yeah. So imagine the the top circle, which actually, from a native cosmological point of view, would be the east. Now, I know that throws everybody off. That's in a Western. You know, you they always think, think it's the north. Think, they think the top is the north, right? Because it is on a map. You know, but a, but a map is a flat piece of paper, and you can right. you can put the top anywhere you want. Correct. You know? so, that's so, true. So so. So I'm actually thinking of it as east because that's the emergence place where the sun rises. So, so the uh, unitive consciousness is the first circle. And then it's dance of the opposites, moving sunwise, so east, south, west. The bottom of the circle is maximum diversity. And to what I would call the North, um, is return to wholeness. So it moves from unitive consciousness to dance of the opposites, to maximum diversity, to return to wholeness, and then back to unitive consciousness. And each part of the cycle has an evolved mode and a devolved mode. And when I say that, it, it's gonna evoke for people, you know, a value judgment. I don't really mean it quite that way. In nature, there's a principle of inertia, and sometimes things have to break down before something new can emerge. Um, so, uh, but uh, the, when I'm talking evolved and devolved mode for unit of consciousness, I call the evolved mode is unity and diversity. Mm -hmm. And I consider that the sacred purpose of America. So the whole arc of the book is trying to get to unity and diversity. To a certain extent, the Founding Fathers wanted unity and diversity, but they had real limits and blinders on what that meant to them. The devolved mode of unitive consciousness would be monarchy or totalitarianism or fascism. And that's unity through sameness. Everybody does the same thing. Okay, it does not include diversity. Um, so then the next arc on the cycle is the dance of the opposites. 
And in that part of the book, I look first at Thomas Paine and Edmund Burke that right. represent the, the prototypical liberal and prototypical conservative point of view. I also look at the birth of the Democratic and Republican parties and how they've become a dance of opposites. They've changed positions on the dance floor since their inception. And then the third part of the book is about maximum diversity, which is really about where we are today. And again, it's at the bottom of the arc. It, it, it's, it's, it's the opposite of uh, unitive consciousness. So it is totally diverse. But the problem with diversity to the extreme is that it can, in the devolved mode, it becomes fragmented, separated, and even anarchy can, can ensue. And some of that is happening in America right now. Um, and then we, we also have, uh, but we have an opportunity to use diversity in a very beautiful way through synergy, cooperation, um, that moves us toward wholeness. So that's the evolved mode of maximum diversity. And then, but, so we're now at the point where we're somewhere between the third and we're looking toward the fourth return to wholeness. Everybody wants to get back to wholeness. Even people who have fascist or totalitarian um, autocratic tendencies want wholeness. They just want wholeness through everybody agreeing with them. <laughs> that's, that's a very important that's concept. A, that's a huge distinction. When you say wholeness, yeah. would you also refer to that as oneness? Because this separation of mind between um, even the Native Americans' beliefs in the gods, right? But the, you know, this separatist mentality that seems to exist, the, the, the me versus we, um, which is what this current administration, and I'm not just throwing rocks, I'm just saying that's the way that it feels. It's like, let's protect us and our land and not, let's, let's not take any, um, let's not pay much attention to what else is going on. It's all about us. But I think when you see that, that's the way the media kind of starts to portray it. And the media has taken a role in this, which has been, I think, quite devastating. But um, I'm curious as to your, you know, when you say a wholeness, I say oneness. Um, is there a distinction for you? Oh, yeah, there's a very big distinction. Um, um, but before I answer that question, I, I want to backtrack a little bit. And because the foundational premise of the book is the profound influence that Native America had on the founding of the United States. And yes, with your permission, is. I'd like to go into that a little bit because, and then we can come back into the question you asked is a very good question for considering what is happening today. Yeah. Um, but the, my doggy wants to join us. So anyway, uh, uh, that's Sunrise here. Sunrise, you want to go on camera? Oh, there she is. Okay. Anyway, uh, She's golden. Um, and when the country was founded, Native Americans had been living side by side with the European settlers for 150 years. Mm -hmm. And the Europeans were coming out of monarchies, systems of monarchy, systems and, and monarchies emerged out of feudalism. So there was never any hint in, in many, many centuries for equality or egalitarianism. So how did these founding fathers come up with this concept? Well, most historians, and, and, uh, and you should not beat yourself up at all because almost the entire culture believes that the founding fathers got their principle from ancient Greek democracies. And to some extent, they drew upon that. But I contend, and there's a lot of evidence to support it, and it's not evidence that I found myself. You know, I, this is, I'm building on the backs of great researchers who have been uh, talking about this all along, but particularly uh -huh. in the last 25 years. Um, there's a lot, a mountain of evidence that really indicates that the Founding Fathers were strongly influenced by the living example of Native American cultures. And... I'll, I'll just give you a couple examples. First, Chief Kana Ostego, of the, who's the Onondaga chief, that Ben Franklin befriends because Ben Franklin has become an Indian commissioner 
who forges a military alliance with the Iroquois in the French and Indian Wars. So they have this friendship, and Chief Conastego says to the colonists on July 4th, 1744, he, he exhorts them to form a confederacy like the Iroquois have done for some estimates as old as 1132 AD or even older. So for centuries and centuries before then, they've already been in a military alliance, or not a military, in a, in a peaceful alliance among the Iroquois. It doesn't mean they didn't war outside of that. They did. Yeah, yeah, sure. <laughs> but they did. But they, but they did. In fact, they were powerful, and that's one of the reasons Britain wanted to form a military alliance with the Iroquois. So they, they uh, Chief Conestego is the first person who says to the colonists, you need to unite, you need to watch what we did. It takes them 32 years, but they do that. And here I happen to have a little image here, which is done by a Mohawk artist. I'm just going to hold it up. This is the Iroquois at Independence Hall speaking to the founding fathers um, in, in uh, uh, 1776. That image is, 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 is to be in my book trailer. It's different than the one you saw, actually. You don't have the final version yet. Okay. So, so uh, it's very important that people realize that. Um, the, the actual first founding document of the United States was the Articles of Confederation. Mm -hmm. That was very closely aligned with the great law of peace that came from the Iroquois. In, in the Iroquois, uh, uh, it was the women who nominated the male council and chiefs, and the women had the right to remove them. The women acted as a wisdom council. So they, uh, they, they had a tremendous power. They had equal power. They were the wisdom council. The men were the ones who enacted the, the wisdom uh, or the strategic vision of the women on behalf of the women and the whole tribe. So that was pretty cool um, and, uh, and very equal and probably the seed of impeachment. The founding fathers credit to Europe, but in Europe you could not impeach the king but you could impeach the king in, in America or the presidents. So the first presidents, and they were, believe it or not, were eight presidents before George Washington under the Articles of Confederation, had relatively little power. That's why historians have dismissed them. But they served a one-year term, and all of their power was derived from the legislature, the council. You didn't have the three branches of government yet. Um, but even the three branches of government, when we moved to the Constitution, that also was drawn from the Iroquois, most likely, because the Iroquois had younger brothers and older brothers. The, the Onondaga were the executive council. Uh, the Mohawk and Seneca were the older brothers. The Cayuga and the Oneida were the younger brothers. So just like in the, in, the, in, the, in, in the United States now, legislation emerges often in the House of Representatives, the Senate has to concur, the executive branch can veto, but the veto can be overridden. The same thing was true for the Iroquois. If, if the Onondaga were to veto and the, the younger and older brothers stead, stayed steadfast in their belief that this action needed to be done, the Onondaga would let that happen. There's a million other examples I could give. There was very, very strong evidence of, of influence from Native America. Even the symbol of the eagle in the, in the Iroquois great law of peace, there's a great tree of peace. The eagle is the one that stands atop it. And the eagle is holding in its, in its talon five arrows for the Iroquois, which symbol the, the union of the five nations, later six, the Tuscarosca join. Um, so that, that is how Chief Conestego suggests that to Ben Franklin. And when he suggests the union, legend has it that he first presented him with one arrow, broke it over his knee, then he reached behind him, got a sheaf of arrows, and, and did the same thing. It did not break. And that's why the symbol of the eagle holding the talon, uh, in its talon, the 13 arrows, is on the great seal of the United States today. Well, so I, the, think, I yeah. think, Glenn, that a lot yeah. of people listening would say that this history 
is extremely important, but kind of fast forwarding to current day, our current sure. political system. Let's, <laughs> okay. let's, okay. let's give your opinion about current politics, but as you state, to put the country back together in full integrity, which I think it's, our moral leadership is gone. Integrity has left um, uh, the current situation that we're in with the administration. But to get it back requires to remember the respect to the living roots of our nation's founding. Um, I don't yes. think that's occurring in the Senate, um, uh, maybe a little bit in the House, but the reality is uh, not with our president. I'm going to be very political at this point. Um, how do you propose that this occur within the current political system? Because you know, look, how did we, how in the hell did we ever get to a two party system? Even though there are more parties, no one else has a freaking voice. Um, and the reality is, is that you could vote liberal, but nothing's ever going to happen uh, because it's just there. It's, it's dead. And I think the, whatever you're saying, if we're going to get back to this full integrity, is going to require a full revamping of this system or something. Yes. Well, good. You, you bring up the word integrity and integrity. A lot of people don't realize really the meaning of it is, is, is wholeness. It's not, it's often used in modern world as kind of in a very linear way. Like somebody with integrity does what he says he's going to do. And da, 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 da. that's part of it, but that's not the whole of it. Um, mm -hmm. So, so, so getting back to your other question about, wholeness, the difference between wholeness and oneness, that really has a lot to do with integrity and a lot to do with your question about what is happening now. Um, wholeness, wholeness to me is, uh, it's a concept that I can't fully grasp, but it is best explained, I think, as the great mystery. You know, what we can't quite get to wholeness because we have limits within our human vision, <laughs> but, but we can do our best to make allies with other, other beings that have access to realms that we don't have access to easily. I mean, that's, that's one of the reasons why the eagle is sacred in Native America, because you, you say your prayers and the eagles and hawks can take it up to higher realms. So you align with other creatures. Um, there's an awareness within all the ancient world and within Native America today, even at that, that human beings have limitations. Um, mm -hmm. and, and there's an awareness within the Western world, within very far reaching scientific communities of that as well. You know, um, not everybody thinks that science is going to solve everything, but some do. Some do. Um, so today we're in a very precarious place. We're in a place where, because there's a lot of diversity in America and the population demographics are changing, they're changing uh, rapidly. This is not going to be a white dominated country in the future um, and so what is occurring is that um, within the parties who have completely switched positions on the dance floor the republican party voted they had more votes for civil rights legislation than democrats in the 1960s but then they switched right the 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 Southern Democrats fled the Democratic Party and became the base of the Republican Party, and the Republican Party became increasingly less, you know, white. It became increasingly white and increasingly conservative. So um, at this point in time, the, Re the Republican Party under Trump, and this was not the case as recently as th three and a half years ago when Romney was running for you know, president, or not three and a half years ago, I'm sorry, uh, seven and a half years ago when, when Romney is running against Obama in 2012. But the Republican Party under Trump, Trump was actually successful in winning, if he even won, but in winning um, by getting out the white vote more. 
you know, I mean, this is this 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 was not the belief in the Republican Party in 2012. They thought, you know, after Romney lost, that they accepted the idea that they needed to change. They needed to create a bigger tent. And I'm very hopeful that that's exactly what will happen if Trump loses now. You know, um, but I don't want to disparage Donald Trump totally because in the that's not what I do in the book. I no you in, don't. in the big picture. He's I, necessary at this time. I mean, everybody I talk to, the disruption that's occurring as a result of it is something that was needed. Um, I know a lot of people would probably disagree with, with what I'm saying, but at the same time, I think it, it um, look, to create change and to change systems, um, whether it's uh, monetary systems, economic systems, political systems, whatever it is, um, this is a big upset for a lot of people, but it is also a shakeup that you, you can't continue on with status quo if you're going to make some change, right? So, yeah. 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 I don't know I if think you agree with that, but that's... No, I do. Well I, well, I think you're wise to realize that in the big picture, Donald Trump is performing some role. I think yeah. it's an unwitting role for him. I compare him to an unwitting trickster. And I, I tell the story, uh, which is White Mountain Apache story in the book, which will frame this for, for your listeners or, or viewers, because this is the way the story goes. There's an old woman who's weaving a beautiful rug. And as she nears completion of the rug, she gets up to stir a soup that's on the fire. But when she gets up to stir the soup, her black dog, who's been sleeping in the corner, awakens and then pulls on a thread and unravels the whole rug. The woman comes back and she's unfazed. She doesn't get angry at the dog, but she picks up one thread and she stares into the rug. And it, there's all this where there was beauty and harmony, this chaos and disorder, but she stares in the rug long enough to reimagine a new way to reweave the rug in beauty and harmony. And, and that's where that's, we are today. That's, that's where we are, you know, and you know, yeah. um, you, I think it's important to get this question in because we want to have to start to wrap up this interview, but you talk about Margaret Fuller and her vision of divine love. And this is a question around the sexes because we're having an issue with Black Lives Matter right now. Again, this isn't the first time that this, that this uprising has occurred. Um, we've had the feminist movements. Uh, they come and they go. Um, but you speak about this to our listeners about the importance of equality in the sexes at this point in history. Um, and I would love for you to give our listeners kind of your viewpoint because Margaret Fuller's vision of divine love um, was something that was important enough for you to write about in the book. Hmm. Yeah, well, Margaret Fuller was a, was a Western woman that was uh, uh, quite a visionary. Um, her father raised her in a very, to, to explore her intellectual curiosity, and she did that. And she, um, she gave this vision of, of love that went far beyond the standards that were the norm in her society. I mean, l marriage was generally pretty utilitarian in a lot of ways. So she considered that on one level, you know. Um, and then there was, she considered a higher level when, when the, your partner becomes the everything to you, the be all end all. And that's one thing. But then there's another level of, of, of uh, deep friendship. And then there was a, the, the top level was spiritual union. Um, and she even gave the, gave uh, room for people who don't get married at all um, mm -hmm. to make a, a union with the divine. Mm -hmm. um, so, so she, she was quite the visionary and, you know, uh, one of the points of the book that I, that I, that I, that I really express is that Margaret Fuller emerges out of, she emerges out of, uh, she was partly influenced by Emerson and Thoreau, but Emerson and Thoreau were influenced by Native America. 
and the women's movement, the women's movement and the abolitionist women are, were both strongly influenced by Native Americans, particularly the women's movement in the 19th century, Elizabeth Cady Stanton, Lucretia Maud, and Matilda Gage, they're strongly influenced by, it's also Haudenosaunee women who model for them an example of true equality. I mean, the other day I was in conversation with Oren Lyons, the faith keeper of the Turtle Clan of the Onondaga today, who's, Oren's 90 years old, and he's saying, you know, Western women still are fighting for equality. You know, they still haven't been able to get to where our women were a long time ago, but you know, you could say actually in, in native culture, there's been some backsliding too, because, because of the influence coming in from the West, uh, women don't enjoy the same equality they once had in Native America either. So nothing is perfect, you know. Um, right. Um, but um, yeah, Margaret Fuller had a beautiful vision. Thank you for asking that. Well, again, it was important. It's an important element in the book. So we're going to wrap up our interview here, and I'm going to ask you the last question. So you ask the reader to consider a new definition of what is politics by responding uh, by repositioning, I should say, politics as a bridge between the human and the more than human natural world. What does that look like? And how do we as listeners, my listeners, participate in this new natural world? Because if this is uh, original politics making uh, America sacred again, how are we, those listeners out there today who buy your book, Go out and pick up the book. We're going to do a little show and tell here again on the book. Um, what, are, what are they going, what actions would you like to see them take as a result of reading this book? I think there is actionable um, opportunity. Well, um, in the end of the book, I'm really suggesting a shift in worldview, a mm -hmm. shift in worldview from politics that are only about you know, human needs to politics that include the natural world that, that uh, if not speaking for mountains, rivers, um, at least uh, uh, considering of them in the whole and listening to uh -huh. all of nature. So one of the things your listeners can do is actually just, you know, what everybody can do, you know, and if you, you don't have to go to Yellowstone Park or something, it could be your backyard, <laughs> you know, and you go out and you listen, you sit down by an anthill and watch ant nations, you, you go sit underneath your tree, there's a reason the Buddha found enlightenment when he did that, because <laughs> there's, trees are like community centers, they bring all of nature around to them, so that's one place that uh, is, uh, a very rich environment to sit and it will be cooler but, in the summer. But you're saying making yeah. a connection to the natural world. In other words, even if the action was to pause, contemplate, meditate, and, and bring yourself back to this wholeness of the natural world as it relates to all of our interactions, right? All of our interactions as, as a human species. Yeah, that's good. You know, what I'm, what I'm, what I'm suggesting is, a, is not just a return to normal, you know, but a return to natural and, and trying to align our actions with what's already unfolding in nature. Mm -hmm. I think if people do that, they'll actually be happier, <laughs> you know, so it's certainly what I try to do. I'm not saying I'm perfect at it by any means, but but the more that we move in the way that's a natural unfolding, the more in sync we feel. You know, we have lots of words for that. You know, the the you know uh, uh, the flow, being in the zone. You know, when you're moving with what's unfolding in nature, you everything is easier. You know, and I'm saying do that for our politics. I mean, the biggest difference, you started out this, you know, our, our discussion talking about climate change. That's one of the big points I'm trying to make is in, in the book is that climate change is looked at in too narrow a way. You know, how are humans affecting nature? But that perpetuates a dichotomy between humans and nature. We are 
the climate. We're made of light, air, water, earth. So what really we need to do is to, is to, is to have climate change teach us how everything is interrelated. Yeah. And, and that is a, that's, a, that's a shift in worldview that could open up a lot of things for people. And, and uh, uh, I, I think it's- And if I you took it important. to a mon- molecular level, we are vibration. So yeah. it's like light, right? The point is we are all light. The question is, you know, we, we can't put our fist through this table, or at least we're not, we're not masters of wisdom, but is this really solid? right? It's like what we're dealing with is to actually uh, vibrate at a new level of consciousness to actually understand and become, uh, I'm going to say, more united, more one um, with everything and everybody. Um, And that would be, you know, my hope. And I'm going to tell the listeners, or at least inform them, uh, great book to open up your thinking right? You call your thing original thinking. And this is really a book that gets you to think. Um, and, and I, for that, I'm going to direct all the listeners again, because I'm going to say this, this is important. You want to go to original thinking us. That's original thinking us. And there you're going to see about Glenn's books, events, media, contact him. Obviously, he makes it very easy to contact him. You can order the book off of that website. Um, But Glenn, it's been a pleasure having you on the show, speaking with our listeners, opening up their minds. Um, I love how you do it because you've used history, you've used Native Americans, you've used current politics, and you've blended this all together in a way that will get us thinking about how we really need, I I think it was Einstein, I wrote it in one of my podcast questions for another one later this afternoon, you know, we, we can't change the thinking from the spot in which we were originally thinking, right? I don't, I messed Um, up that, but there is a, Einstein had a great one, right? And we, we, we can't change what we're doing, you know what I mean? And so we've got to think about it different, differently, but I do like the word origin, Mm -hmm. Uh, because it is original, (laughs) Uh, but it doesn't mean that it's new. I like what you said. Um, So that's, that's important. Uh, A few parting words and then we'll uh, wrap up here. Do you have anything you want to leave with the listeners? Well, sometimes, yeah, just say sometimes uh, something is so old that it's thought of as new again, because we just went it was marginalized or repressed <laughs> when it reemerges it's new yeah and that's that's okay yeah. uh, i just really appreciate the uh, the conversation we could talk for much longer I'm sure. we could and we'll probably do a version two of this but let's get out version one and see how uh, my audiences respond to the book but glenn thanks again for being on appreciate having you on inside personal growth thank you thank you very much Oh, this is inside personal growth. Do I have time to say one more thing? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, the, there's actual words, personal growth, appear in my book in one place only. Uh, that's where I am doing my best to be kind and compassionate to our, our current president, who obviously has difficulty in letting any insults slide and so, you know, he has to, he has to fight back harder than the insult of, toward him. Right. So that's because he has to be the one who trumps. So I really pray for him in a way that he would gain the maturity to be able to, uh, uh, to not act that way. And so I think I actually use the words, um, if that makes me a Trump supporter, then so be it. You know, I'm for his personal growth. I'm for his personal growth. There I am you too. <laughs> you know, the, the reality is, is that ego can definitely, edging God out can be a really strong thing. I've had a friend say that E-G-O means edging God out. And, oh, that's interesting. You know, and and I, I think that, uh, look, he could take a lot of lessons from a lot of people, whether he is or not, or he's mature enough. Uh, in his focus. Um, I know there's a new book coming out that his uh, niece wrote, 
uh, which yes. is very controversial. I don't know if it's out yet, but from what I see about his own personal history and upbringing, uh, you, you, you literally, from what this book is going to tell the story of, you can see kind of why he is the way he is. So, um, I, I know, but ultimately he is part of us. That's one point I make, you know, politicians are a reflection of us and they're a reflection of the country because we voted them in. So, so this is an opportunity for us to learn. And that's, you know, we, we can't just say Donald Trump bad, we good. <laughs> I mean, it's like, you know, there's, there's, there's always a projection going on. You know, part, there are some things that he does that maybe we've done. And that's why it's so offensive. Yeah. So, so that is, it's a very complex thing. And I'm not trying to belittle the danger because it's a very dangerous time. And he's a very dangerous, er erratic leader. But at the same time, um, hopefully it's allowed us to see America as it really is. And then, we, and then from here, we can make greater change. And I think it's already happening with the unfolding of consciousness, with the Black Lives yeah, Matter movement. You know, so. Well, Glenn, thanks for being on. I got another author waiting on the line to get in. And mm -hmm. I will give you, uh, I'll send you an email back a little bit later. Thanks a ton. A ton. Thank you so much, Greg. Okay, Thank you. Namaste. Namaste.